accepting the opportunity that I can give you this talk. And um, so, yeah, I will speak a little bit about recent developments in um, Morita theory in deformation quantization. And um, so the whole thing will be based on a, oops, on a joint work um, uh, on, on, well, two, two collaborations. On one hand with um, Henrik Burstein and um, uh, Vasily Dolgoshev. And on the other hand um, with um, Stefan Janssen, um, Nikolai Neumeyer and um, Gregor Schaumann. Um, these two guys were students of mine, and Nikolai Neumeyer, um, you know him, I guess, m m most of you. Um, it's, it's a sad story that he passed away this spring after two years of heavy cancer and everything, so I would like to dedicate this um, lecture to his memory. Yeah, yeah? So, so this was one of his last, um, last pieces of work here. Okay, so... What, what, what about Morita equivalent? So, so I should probably first explain this a little bit. And why one should be interested in such things. So this will be now a little bit algebraic. So, so the, the setting is that, that, that I'm interested in unital, and unital is just for, for making things easier. There are classes of non-unital algebras where this works as well. Um, algebras over um, some commutative ring C. So, um, for example, C can be the complex numbers or um, the complex formal powers here. Yeah? So that's for deformation quantization, the two important um, cases. Yeah? And so, so the idea is that, that um, you, you have a notion of, of homomorphisms of algebras. Yeah? So, so these are good notions of algebra homomorphisms. Yeah? And um, for, for many reasons, this is, uh, in some sense, a very s strict concept, and you want to ex uh, um, widen your, your, your um, concepts, and you want to have more morphisms than just algebra homomorphisms. Yeah? You want to have more arrows between algebras than just algebra homomorphisms. And so the, the, the idea is to replace this by um, bimodules. That's the, that's the idea. So, so, so we consider now an arrow from A going to B as a bimodule and BA bimodule. That's the idea. Yeah? So, so, and why, why is that reasonable? Um, that is reasonable because we can compose bimodules as we can also compose homomorphisms. Yeah? And, and so is the, what is the composition? Well, that, that will be the tensor product over the algebra in the middle. Yeah? So, so, th so the, the picture is that we go from with some bimodule E from A to B, and then we go with some bimodule F to another algebra C, and um, well, the composition will be then the tensor product um, over the algebra in the middle. Yeah? So that will be a CA bimodule. So that's classical stuff. And um, we, we also have a unit um, that will be the trivial bimodule where A acts on itself from, by left and right multiplications. And so, um, so the idea is this, this is a category. Well, not quite, um, because um, tensor products are not as, as, uh, associative, and this is not really a unit, only after you implement isomorphisms. Yeah? So this is, um, we have to pass to isomorphism classes of bimodules and then um, tensor is, is well defined and, and is associative and um, the class of this guy here is really a unit yeah? so um, well, alternatively, you, you, you also can say, well, I don't want to do that. Why, why should I? Uh, and I take into account that 
tensor product is not really isomorphism, but only is uh, associative, but only associative up to some um, canonical um, isomorphism, and, and, and that would give you then a, um, a, a, a bicategory approach. Yeah? So, so this, this will give you here really an, a category. Um, and I will denote this category as the category of bimodules. And alternatively, we can, we can use a, a bicategory, which I denote then. I mean, the more abstract the, the notions in mathematics are, the more fancy letters you have to use for it. But I can't draw very fancy letter, so I just hey, underline it now. Yeah? Um, so, so this will be then, then the idea that, that we also, well, we have arrows being bimodules uh, bi between the algebras. And so if we have another arrow, E prime, then we can have some um, bimodule homomorphism, and these constitute the the two arrows, yeah? and, and so this is all a very classical construction, and that, that gives you then a bi-category. So um, the, the associative, uh, the, the, the failure of associativity of composition of this tensor product is encoded by a natural um, isomorphism of um, bimodules. And so um, please don't ask me to write down all the coherence diagrams. Yeah, that would take half an hour. You're not interested in knowing that. But now we can define what is Morita equivalence very easily. So the definition, um, um, Morita equivalence is simply isomorphism in this category of bimodules, yeah? or in the bi category if you prefer. So, so two algebras are called Morita equivalent if and only if there is a bimodule between them such that it is invertible with respect to the tensor product, which means that there's also a bimodule in the other direction such that the tensor product gives you the units A and the units B in the other direction. Yeah? That's the probably more, most conceptual definition of what, um, of what Morita equivalence is. And, and in any category, you have a, have a groupoid and, and of, of the invertible arrows. Yeah? So the invertible arrows, in this case, is called the Picard groupoid. So, and, and, and I will denote that by, by PIC. Yeah? And um, in any bi category, you have also a bi groupoid of invertible one morphisms. That would give now um, the co corresponding bi groupoid is then pick underlined. Yeah? So the, the pick up bi groupoid, if you prefer the bi category approach. Yeah? So, so the, the, in some sense, you see that um, understanding Morita theory boils down to understanding this groupoid. Yeah? This is just another way to phrase this. Yeah? And, um, and, and so, in particular, this gives you. The isotropies, isotropy groups at a given object, that is then the Picard group of A. Yeah? And that encodes, in some sense, how many self-equivalences do we have up to isomorphism. Yeah? So that, that, that is what is Morita equivalence about. And I should mention that there are still some other versions of that which are of interest if you're thinking about quantization, as I want to do later. So um, th these, these other versions, they are motivated by um, C-star algebra theory, where you have additional structure. You have not just some algebra over some funny ring, yeah, but you have um, a star involution. The ring is the complex numbers. You have notions of positivity and all that. And you want to kind of take care of this additional structure and you want to take care of this in, in encoding it in, in, in your bimodules. Yeah? So, so the, the setting will now be uh, the following, that our ring C, which was just a commutative unital ring before, but now it should be um, kind of the complex numbers corresponding to an ordered ring. So like R could be Z or 
are or formal power series, which is an ordered ring, yeah, something like that, and, and the corresponding complexified version, so I square should be minus one, yeah, it's a ring extension. And um, so we have now um, star algebras over this ring. That means we have an um, anti-linear involutive anti-automorphism specified, yeah, like, like the adjoint of operator algebras. Yeah. And now we want to equip, in addition, the bimodules with an inner product, which should take values in the algebra on the left, yeah, on, the, on the right, the other left. Yeah. So that, that should be a map, um, an algebra valued inner product, with the following properties, well, they don't fit in here. Let's put this here. Um, so what, what do we require? It should be C linear in the second argument. It should also be linear for the algebra multiplication, so, so I am allowed to take out algebra elements like that. If we exchange the order, that will cost us the star involution of, of A. Yeah? And um, it should be non-degenerate. And finally, I want a compatibility with the B left module structure in a way that I can put the B to the other side. Yeah? So this, this would um, give me a, a nice notion of inner product bimodules. And um, we can kind of refine our category of bimodules in this situation. Um, so this will a right, refined version, which I will denote by bimod with a little star here. Yeah? And we can do, do even better than that. I, I will come to geometry immediately. Yeah? So, so we, we can even do better than that. We can also add some positivity. I'm not going to, to, to write down what, what it actually means, but, but the idea is that if you plug in here the same element of your bimodule, then there should be something like a positive algebra element. And if you elaborate a little bit on that, then you, you see that this all makes, makes sense. And this gives a, 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 a version which I call strong in adaption to the notion of strong Morita equivalence of C-star algebras. Yeah? So, and, um, so, so you can check that there's also a tensor product of these guys, that everything behaves nicely. So this, this will form, again, categories. Um, and in particular, we have now the invertible arrows in here will be the star Morita equivalences and um, the invertible arrows in, in here will be the strong Morita equivalences. So this will be the star and the strong Picard groups, uh, groupoids. Yeah. So these are certain flavors of, of um, of uh, Morita equivalence. And now, I should somehow tell you that how, how that boils down to something which you know from your algebra textbooks. Um, so, so there's a classical theorem of Morita that um, such a thing is an equivalence by module, Morita equivalence by module. So it's invertible in our category by mod, if and only if um, there exists an idempotent in some matrices over your algebra, some, for some finite n, yeah, um, such that two things are satisfied as a right module. The thing is just a projective module defined by this um, idempotent E. And um, the idempotent is kind of non-trivial enough that if you take all of its 
coefficients in this matrix and take the ideal, the two-sided ideal generated by it, then you get the whole algebra. Yeah? And in this case, um, the algebra B is then just um, the, the module endomorphisms of this projective module, which is this. Yeah? Um, so, so, so you have a kind of rather concrete description of Morita equivalence by modules um, in terms of idempotence. Yeah? And so now that brings us now to the, to the geometry side. Yeah? So, so what I'm interested in is, of course, in algebras being the, the, the functions, smooth complex-valued functions on the manifold. And, and so what, what are the, 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 the finitely generated projective modules? Well, they are sections of vector bundles. Yeah? So, so that... Um, that um, you know, that is just the, sec the sections of some vector bundle E over M. And, um, and you, you, you check that this condition automatically holds if you don't have zero-dimensional fibers. Yeah? So all of those vector bundles are Morita equivalence by modules. Yeah? And the corresponding algebra B is then just uh, up to isomorphism, the endomorphism, um, the sections of the endomorphism bundle. Yeah, so that, that's that's kind of the um, the, the situation. And but beware, um, here you still have an algebra isomorphism for free. Yeah, so you can um, kind of transport things by a diffeomorphism to a different manifold, uh, to a diffeomorphic manifold. Yeah, so we'll play a certain role later. Okay, so um, now let's see what what can we do about deformation theory of these um, of these bimodules. To um, come here to um, so um, so I'm, I'm I'm looking for the, the following the simplest version um, let's let's keep track of the ring over which we want to do things so so I want to take now formal power series. A formal power series ring, and, and I want to consider this, this whole business here over such a ring. And, and inside here, we have a, a, a subcategory, make this bold face, huh? um, of those where the objects are of the form being deformations of algebras with some associative deformation of an algebra over C. So this is, um, this guy here is an uh, algebra over C. Yeah? So this, they, 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 they form a subcategory. For the bimodules, I do not put any restrictions. And, um, and then you can define a classical limit map. So you, 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 you know what the classical limit is here. Yeah, sure, that's, that's the, the, the thing for H bar equals zero. And um, well, and the, and the classical limit of a, of a bimodule over such deformations, well, what you, what you do is um, do the most stupid thing. You just quotient by, by, um, by the uh, multiples of h bar. Yeah? So that's the most stupid thing. And, um, and then what you get is a, is a functor from these deformations into the um, bimodules now for, for algebras over C alone without formal policies. I mean, this is, this is easy to check that this kind of thing is compatible with building tensor products. Yeah? So, that's, um, that's, um, so we have a classical limit. Yeah? And um, there's also a star or strong version. This is a little bit more sophisticated because this, this is too simple. Yeah? You have to take care of the inner products as well. And if you only quotient by the multiples of h bar, then it might happen that the inner, inner products um, lose this non-degeneracy condition. Yeah? So in some sense, you have not to divide only by the powers of h bar, the positive powers, but by the degeneracy spaces as well. If you do that, then you get these versions here. Yeah? So, um, so um, in particular, being a functor, this boils down to group homomorphisms of the Picard groups of the deformation to the um, undeformed, to its classical limit. So there's a group homomorphism, canonically group homomorphism. And um, I may put here a star or a strong if you want. Yeah? 
under that there are some technical issues yeah so 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 the idea is now that that you want to understand um, um, Morita equivalence of the deformations in terms of Morita equivalence of the classical limits and so in some sense you would like to understand what are, what are kernel and images of these maps of these classical limit maps yeah of uh, this this is the the program and now let's be a little bit more specific I mean in this generality you cannot say much but um, Let's pass on really to deformation quantization. Yeah, so, second part, what's the situation in deformation quantization? So, our algebra will be smooth functions on a Poisson manifold. And, um, and so that's denote the Poisson tensor by pi 1. And, and, and consider now kind of a a deformation of this, so so this should be. Um, th that's why I put it in, in in order one. I incorporate here the the, the deformation parameter already here, and um, such that um, we have Jacobi identity satisfied order by order. Yeah. So this means that pi one is a honest Poisson structure, pi two is a Poisson cocycle for pi one, and so on and so on. Yeah. So this, suppose we have such a thing. If you want, you can put all these higher guys here to zero. Yeah, then it's just pi one being a Poisson structure. So these are called formal Poisson tensors. Yeah, and um, and one calls two formal Poisson tensors um, equivalent um, if there exists a formal vector field also starting in uh, in in first order of H bar such that. Um, the, the, the exponential of the Lie derivative acting on one of them gives the other one. And you see that's, that's why I put here the h bar already one. So this is really a well-defined formal power series. Yeah? So this is, this is sort of formally diffeomorphic Poisson structures. Yeah? That's, that's the idea here. Yeah? And so the, 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 the moduli space of, of these formal Poisson tensors modulo formal diffeomorphisms, so... Um, that gives kind of the formal Poisson structures um, on M. Yeah? So um, in particular, it follows from here that the, the first order terms coincide. Yeah? So, so in some sense, I can, I can refine this. I'm, I'm interested in for the formal Poisson um, 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 vectors having the same, the same first order term. So that's... that's the classical side, and this is a horrible object. Yeah? I mean, this this is this is a, a nightmare to compute. Yeah? This this is in the symplectic case. This is easy, but but in, if, if if it's truly Poisson, I think there's no good technology available to to, to determine this in any reasonable sense. Yeah? Um, okay. So so what is now a star product? Just to remind you, um, this is an a product um, where we have. Um, by differential operators, the CRs, I should put it some, some H, power of H bar here. So the C, CRs are by differential operators. The whole thing is associative. Um, zeroth order will be just the ordinary pointwise product, and the first order, um, uh, at least the anti symmetric part, that will be the, 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 the Poisson bracket coming from, from the, the, the first order term here. Yeah? So, and um, I do have some physics background, so I should put an I here. Yeah? So, um, but that's just a, a matter of, of convention. And, and so, so such things are called star products. And if we have two of them, we also have a notion of equivalence. Well, if they are called equivalent, if there exists a series of... Um, of um, formal um, uh, uh, a series of, of, of differential operators um, preserving the unit. I, I should say that I also want that um, that the constants really act as constants. Yeah? So so preserving the constants and um, transforming one star product in the other, meaning it's an algebra isomorphism. Yeah? So. So I want um, T of F 
with one star product is T of F, and then here it's the other star product. Yeah? And so we also get um, moduli space of deformations of M. Yeah? So, so these are all the, the star products modulo these notions of equivalence. And what you see here is that, that also the first order terms here um, of the, of the, um, the anti-symmetric part of the first order terms, they coincide. So we can again put in here a fixed first order term and um, we, will not, never, ever, we will never leave that doing this kind of operation. So, so this is the, the situation of, um, of, of star products. And now, okay, there, there's a long story why this is interesting and what are the results on it and in particular um, one has existence and classification according to Konsevich and, and that, that works as well. So, so um, Um, that works as follows. So, so we have to choose a global, and I would like to have it also differential formality. Um, let's denote this by k. Yeah? And um, what, what that, I, so, 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 well, I don't want to give a definition what a formality map is. Yeah? This, this, uh, um, but this allows you to, um, to associate to every formal Poisson structure like this um, a star product um, by, by a formula. Yeah? I mean, this, this, this thing, the, the, this formality consists of, of zillions of maps, and, and so, so this will be just um, their, their components of this formality. And the thing you have to do is to plug in this this, um, this bivector field R times in the R Taylor coefficient of this formality, sum up the whole thing, and you see that's, that's why I put the H bar already in front of the Poisson structure, so this is a well-defined formal policy, is that this gives you the star product. Yeah? And, and, uh, and, the, and the statement is, well, first of all, this is a star product for every pi, and even better, it induces... Um, a bijection between the space of formal Poisson structures um, and the formal star products. Yeah? On the level of equivalence, this becomes a bijection. Yeah? So, so the, the, the idea, the, the program is now very clear. If, if, if I want to say something about um, Morita equivalence of star products, I know in some sense how to classify them, namely by classical data. Yeah? And I would like to understand Morita equivalence of star products in terms of this classical data. Yeah? But beware, I mean, this is, this is not really a very good classification because this space is enormous. Yeah? This is usually very, very difficult to control. Yeah? In the symplectic case, this space is easy. It's just the formal power series in the second Deram cohomology, but, but in, 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 in the true Poisson case, this is monstrous. Yeah? Okay, so the question is... Um, Question, classify Morita equivalence of star products in terms of the pies, the corresponding pies, yeah? the, the, um, the, the, the classes, I should say. Yeah? So, so um, this, this is what one would like to do. Okay. And, and, and so there are, there are two effects. Yeah? So which we can separate. So, so first of all, we can, we can choose, suppose we have a, um, a Poisson diffeomorphism. Yeah. And um, then, then, then we can, we, we know that this, um, we can use this Poisson diffeomorphism just to pull back the star product. We declare it to be an algebra isomorphism. Yeah, this is now a, lo a non-local operation. But then these two star products, they are simply isomorphic via phi. I, I mean, this is how I built this one. Yeah? So an isomorphic algebra, say, a Morita equivalent. So this is, in some sense, a trivial way to implement Morita equivalence. And, and um, what one can show is that there's a certain covariance of the of the formality um, is that they are not equal, yeah? but they are equivalent yeah? here. 
So, 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 um, so there's a there's a, a trivial way how the, the, the Poisson diffeomorphisms kind of act on Morita equivalence classes of star products in term, simply by acting on the corresponding Poisson structures. So this is the trivial way. Yeah? And I would like to do the non-trivial way, and, and, and remember that, that we, we have to talk about bimodules in Morita equivalence. And so the non-trivial bimodules kind of come from honest vector bundles, yeah? from line bundles in our case, because we want the algebra on the left and on the right to be of the same size. It should not become sections of an endomorphism bundle of a big vector bundle. Yeah? So the other way is via a line bundle. And, um, and so the idea is that you have to deform, and this is always possible, the line bundle into a right module for your star product, the one which you start with. Yeah? So you make it a right module. Yeah? And this is always possible in an essentially unique way. Yeah? And even better, you get for free also a deformation, a star product of the endomorphisms of the line bundle. But the endomorphisms of the line bundle are just a uh, are just the functions again. Yeah? So we get, we get a star product acting from the left and a star product acting from the right for every line bundle. And so, so, so the, the way is compute, what, what we have to do is to compute this, the class of the thing on the left, which is uniquely determined yeah, by the line bundle in terms of, of well, the class of pi. Yeah, that's, that's the one we, we know. We want to know which formal Poisson structures correspond to this star prime under this map. Yeah? We, we, we have such a formality to choose. So, and, um, and, okay, so how is that done? Well, I, I won't give you the, the proof. This is sort of technical, but um, give you the result. And um, in some sense, the result is, is, is not even very surprising. I mean, what kind of data do you have? Yeah? I mean, it's, it's just playing Lego. Yeah? How can you put together the bricks which lie on the table? You have this formal Poisson structure, pi, and you have a line bundle. And out of the line bundle, you can cook up a two-form, the curvature. Yeah? And, 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 and it, it is kind of an, it should be an instinctive um, <laughs> um, um, reaction whenever you have a Poisson structure and a closed two form, you should do a gauge transformation. I mean, this, this should be, I mean, this is the, the only thing which you can do. Yeah? And in some sense, this is exactly what happens. Yeah? This, is, this is exactly what comes out. So um, just to, to remind this, so, so we, we choose um, a closed two form, so a curvature representing representing um, the, the, the churn class of the line bundle, and we, let's put in here the 2 pi i in front. Yeah? So, um, and now, um, we, what, what can we do with a, with a two form? Yeah? So, whenever we have a, a two form um, on the manifold, or even a whole bunch of them, um, what we can do, we can act on formal Poisson structures by, by um, doing the following, we, we associate to, the, to our formal Poisson structure first a, a formal bundle map yeah, from, from um, cotension to tension bundle. So this is a, the, just the, the, the sharp map, yeah, the, the sharp or flat, I don't know, sharp, I think. Yeah? Um, and, and to get a new, um, and how do gauge transformations work? To get a new bivector field, you, you just um, make out, out of the B also the corresponding bundle map. And then you um, compose them and do that before applying this. And, and this is then the, 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 the gauged, um, I don't know, we, 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 we call this like that. I don't know, this, this, the, the, the action of B on pi. And the statement is that, uh, well, this, this is kind of uh, also a bundle map. And, and the little lemma, what, what you show is that this is indeed corresponding to a Anti uh, to a sequence of anti-symmetric um, bivector fields, and if B is closed, then this will be Poisson again. Yeah? And, and, and the point is, in general, I mean, geometrically, gauge transformations are kind of tricky, but uh, because this thing doesn't have to be invertible, right? Uh, but in our case, it's, of course, a formal power series, and because I put a H bar in front of the pi already. 
Yeah? So this will always be invertible. It's a formal gauge transformation, if you want. Yeah? So this gives a well-defined action. And, um, and um, this even descends to an action on, on um, uh, uh, this, these classes. Yeah? Um, so this descends to an action of, um, um, well, the Dram cohomology formal power series. So I take only closed ones in order to get a, get a Poisson structure, and then this defines an action on the formal Poisson structures on here. Yeah? And, and so the, the theorem, what we proved, so this is with um, Henrique, um, uh, Vasily, and myself, so that, that, is, that we can compute the class of this star product here to be uh, to, to correspond under this formality um, to the uh, class coming from this this action if if, if um, we act here um, with a with a um, church class yeah of the line bundle so that's that's this b here yeah so this is the b here yeah so this is this is the the theorem and so in in, in some sense you have now completely understood um, how the um, how the star products uh, behave under Morita equivalence, and um, and in, in in terms of the classical data, it's it's it's, it's about the um, the churn class of the line bundle, which acts by a gauge transformation on the formal Poisson structures corresponding to the to the um, yeah here, here we continue. Okay, so so now. Um, would like to present you also some of the results from from the um, the other paper I, I mentioned with the, with the other group, and that is that is in the symplectic setting. I mean, probably we should just look at how this looks in the symplectic case. Yeah? It becomes much easier. Yeah. So so the point is in the symplectic case, and this was kind of a um, work with um, Enrique and myself, I think. 2002 or something like that, so, so very, very much earlier. So the, the, the classes of symplectic star products um, are in one-to-one -one correspondence with what is called now the characteristic class of this star product. So it is um, an element in the formal power series of the second Dram cohomology. And um, for convenience, you choose um, a kind of an affine version of it. Yeah? So this is just, um, this is just a convention. Yeah? And, um, and if you do that, then, then you can compute the, the class of, of uh, the star product on the left if you start with some class on the right. And then this thing just becomes the addition of the of the churn class. Yeah? So, so, I mean, this is, in some sense, this is the formula you guess. You just invert this equation. Yeah? So, so, so then, then, then it, this is, if, if you view this characteristic class as a deformation of the symplectic form. Yeah? So, so in some sense, um, this, this statement is not very surprising yeah? if, you, if you believe in the symplectic way. And, and I should say that, um, that there was a, a paper also around that time by, um, Yurcho, Schupp, and Wess, which, um, which uh, uh, found this result, um, uh, I would say, locally. Yeah? So, so they used very specific features of the, of the local formula of, of the Konsevich uh, formality in Rn, and, and, and they, they cooked up this result. But, but this is now really the, the global statement, and it, it doesn't depend on which formality you choose. Yeah? So, so, so it, it, uh, it works for all formalities which have these, these features of consisting of, um, uh, of, of multi-differential operators and, and so on. Okay, so... Um, the third thing I would like to speak about is incorporating symmetries. So, um, of course, it's, it's clear that, that we, we, we have a lot of group actions or Lie algebra actions on our, our Poisson or symplectic manifolds, and in some sense we want also lift those to, 
symmetries of the corresponding star products. And then the question is, can we also um, um, have the symmetry acting on the bimodules? Yeah? So, so we want, want kind of a covariant version of um, Morita equivalence. And, and so, the, um, the, so, so we have actions of, let's say, a Lie algebra or a Lie group or better Hopf algebra H on on your, your algebras A, B, and so on. So it's, it's one and the same symmetry which you consider once and for all. And, and you take all the possible algebras with, which carry this kind of symmetry. So a Lie algebra acts by derivation, a, a, gr a group acts by automorphisms, and a Hopf algebra acts in a Hopf algebra way. Yeah? So this combines the two. And I mean, I'm not, not interested in Hopf algebras at all, but I don't want to distinguish these two cases. Yeah? It's just a matter of laziness yeah? that, that I take um, Hopf algebras instead of either Lie groups or Lie algebras. And so, so we also want H acting on the bimodules in a compatible way. And I don't even want to write down. It's, it's pretty obvious what you want to do. Yeah, I mean, you want, if, if, if you think of a Lie algebra, then, then it should also be kind of, you, you require a Leibniz rule for the, for the left multiplications and the right multiplications. And, and, and so it's, it's pretty clear what compatible means. And um, what you check is the tensor products behave well. Yeah? So we still can form tensor products of bimodules having the symmetry, and then the tensor product has, again, canonically the symmetry. Yeah? So, so, uh, um, so this way, we get a refined version of Morita equivalence. So because we get this um, kind of a refined version um, of our bimodule category now carrying the symmetry encoded by the Hopf algebra or the Lie algebra or the group or whatever you want, yeah? the symmetries. And um, also a little bit more sophisticated concerning these this compatibilities here is the case where you have either um, 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 inner products or even completely positive inner products. And you also have to say that the group or Lie algebra should act um, on, uh, should behave well with respect to the inner product. But you can do that, and then, then everything matches. So we get, we get categories like this. Yeah? And, um, and then it's H equivariant Morita equivalence star or strong, if you want, is isomorphism in this bimodule category with a symmetry or in the corresponding um, one having in addition these inner products. Yeah? So this is, this is the definition of what is H equivariant um, Maurice equivalence. You, you also find H covariant in the, in the literature. Yeah? And, and, and so this, this is the same thing. Yeah? OK. And in particular, what, what we would like to understand, I mean, this is the corresponding um, group point of invertible arrows. Yeah? So this is the equivariant um, Picard group point, yeah? either star, strong, or ring theoretic version. Yeah? And um, so I should mention probably two constructions here, which you can, can do. Um, we are interested in, in deformations. So there, there's a, a classical limit. Um, we can even deform the symmetries. Yeah? So, so we can have a Hopf algebra deformation as well. Maybe the trivial one, maybe an interesting one if you're interested in quantum groups. And then what you, what you get is, again, a classical limit functor from the, the deformed algebras. Um, with a deformed symmetry, which might be the same or not, star or strong version or not, into the, um, the undeformed ones which, um, with, with the undeformed symmetry. Yeah? So, so as, as before, and again, this, because it's a functor, it boils down to a groupoid homomorphism for invertible ones. Yeah? And so um, 
so this leads to a classical limit um, for the the, uh, the Picard group point of deformed stuff into the Picard group point of the undeformed stuff. Yeah? And um, so you want to understand image and kernel of this groupoid homomorphism if you want to understand which deformations are Morita equivalent in terms of their classical data. Yeah? Um, the other construction is that we all simply can forget stuff, yeah? all, all kind of stuff which we have implemented. Yeah? So for example, we can start with a, with a um, strong version where the inner products are, have a positivity and are invariant under the symmetries. So we can forget about the positivity. We just treat them as inner products whether they are um, positive or not. Yeah? Or we can forget about the inner products at all. Or we can forget about those here. Yeah? And then you also can forget about the symmetries. You can also here forget about the symmetry but keep the inner products. And now you see, I mean, you, you can, at the end you have forgotten everything. And, and so you have a huge big diagram, commuting diagram of, of groupoid morphisms here. And you can try to make, make sense out of images and kernels here in order to, to understand the more complicated objects ultimately in terms of the easy ring theoretic um, um, objects here, yeah, of, of, of the ring theoretic Picard group. So there, there, with Henrique, um, um, we have done a lot of these, these kind of things and investigations of these arrows of subjectivities and injectivities of, of, of this on the level of Picard groups. And um, uh, in the last construction, probably also interesting, are cross products. Um, there, um, we heard yesterday in Xiang Tang's talk that, that cross products are very interesting, yeah, so, so, um, and, and the Morita equivalence of those. Um, so what we can do is we can form, if, if our algebra carries a Hopf algebra symmetry, then, then we can form a sort of cross product. It's, um, as a vector space, it's, it's just a, the tensor product, but you have kind of the multiplication is not that of a, of a tensor product of algebras, but you have a kind of twisted multiplication in incorporating the, the action of H on A. And, and, you, and it's, 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 it's rather easy to see that if you have a bimodule which carries this symmetry, you can also um, build a kind of cross product bimodule which as a underlying vector space is again E tensor H, but where the, the bimodule structure is now funny, and it will be a bimodule over the cross products. Uh, and so this gives, um, let's say, a kind of cross product functor from bimodules with symmetry, either strong or uh, star or without inner product, into those where you have kind of um, the the, the, um, uh, the symmetry already implemented, yeah? so in, into those. But now on, on objects, this, this thing here is, is no longer the identity. In all these here, on objects, it was the identity, but here you really move from A to the cross product. Yeah? So, so, and, and you can, but, but it's clear that this is now, of course it's a functor, it maps invertible arrows to invertible arrows, so we get also a groupoid morphism here, yeah? and, and we, we, we can try to understand um, the, um, the, the, the Morita equivalence of cross products in terms of Morita equivalence of uh, H covariant Morita equivalence of the original algebras. And, I mean, you see already, if, if you have an arrow from A to B here, then you have one from the cross products to the cross products. Yeah? So, so this, is, this is obvious, yeah? that, that if, if, the, if the algebras are H covariantly or H equivariantly Morita equivalent, then their cross products will be Morita equivalent as well. Yeah? This, is, this is clear. Yeah? Okay. And um, so, so this is, one can study these kind of things and, and try also to understand image and kernel of these maps. This is kind of, the, the, the kernels can be understand, uh, understood quite well. The images are very difficult. Yeah? That's, that's a general feature in this thing. Okay, last thing um, is now the following 
make this a little bit more precise, uh, more specific with the symmetry. So we have a Lie algebra action on, on, our, uh, on a symplectic manifold. So this is the thing which we can do. And we, we assume throughout that we have a gene variant connection. And we also have a gene variant symplectic connection, which is important then we can do Fedosov's construction. This is a rather weak assumption. Yeah? So for example, if your Lie algebra action comes from a proper Lie group action, then you will have an invariant connection. Yeah? But um, there are Lie group actions which are by far not proper, but still you can have an invariant connection. Yeah? Think of symplectic affine group acting on R2n. Yeah? The flat connection is clearly invariant, but the action is far from being proper. Okay, so this is, this is a, an, a technical assumption which you have to do. Yeah? And, um, and then um, it is known that, that you have a Fedosov construction and um, this, this uses an invariant connection and, and what, what you do is you, you choose uh, a sequence of um, close two forms and you can cook out of them a star product um, and in such a way that the, this characteristic class I mentioned before is just uh, the, the, um, the class, uh, the, there might be some, some H bars wrong, yeah? so something like that. It's the class of the, of the capital omega essentially. Yeah? This, this, and, and, and I mean, it, it uses the connection which you have, this construction, and it, and, but then it is functorial. In particular, all symmetries which you have for the connection and all symmetries which you have for the omega, you will have for the star product as well. Yeah? So if this capital omega is G invariant, then it follows that this star product here is G invariant as well. Yeah? So the, the, the fundamental vector fields um, um, act by derivations of the star product. Yeah? Okay, so um, this leads to a refined version of a characteristic class here. This, this, um, um, and, you, and, and, and you can show that, on the other hand, every star product on a symplectic manifold, which is G invariant, is G invariantly equivalent to such a guy. Yeah? So this, this allows to, to define... And this is uh, a paper of um, Biljavsky, Bertelsen, Goethe in the, I don't know, uh, around 2000, I think. Yeah? Um, allows to define a kind of a little g invariant characteristic class, which is now a formal series, again, if you want, in this affine space, um, um, in the um, invariant Durham cohomology. The g invariant Durham cohomology. Yeah? And this classifies really the invariant star products for the Lie algebra, always under this assumption. Hmm? And now, of course, well, um, we would like to understand what is G equivalent Morita equivalence of these guys in terms of their classes. Yeah? And, um, and um, so the, the theorem, um, which is not, probably not very much surprising, is the following. That, um, that you have to look for the, for the following. So suppose you have two um, G invariant um, um, star products on your symplectic manifolds and you have a um, G invariant connection on it, yeah? uh, on M omega. Yeah? So, so what is the classification then? So the star products are Morita equivalent in a G-invariant way, G-equivariant way, if and only if, we have the following. There exists a symplectomorphism, a G-invariant symplectomorphism. This is kind of the, um, the silly thing, yeah, that, that you remember, that, that we have two effects for Morita equivalence. Five minutes, perfect. <laughs> um, that the, one is the, the global non-local thing and, and the other one is coming from the line bundle. So this is the, the, the non-local thing. It's a, a G-invariant um, 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 symplectomorphism such that 
if you pull back one of the one of them, I mean it's, it's symmetric. Take again this difference that of the of the G invariant classes that this thing um, is in the image um, of the map which um, um, uh, maps uh, the equivariant cohomology into the invariant one without h bar power. So, so this doesn't have any h bar powers anymore. Yeah? So the higher order simply have to coincide. It's in the image of that one and maps into um, the integral ones. I mean, we need the line bundle, right? So, so and maps into um, um, H2, the RAM, um, the integral ones. Yeah. So, so this is um, this is the the classification, the full classification of the Lie algebra invariant um, star products under invariant um, Morita equivalence. Yeah. And I mean, the idea is well, you 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 have to see what. But um, if you have a line bundle around um, 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 such that its churn class comes from something in the equivariant cohomology, that, that means that you have a lift yeah, of the action and an invariant connection on the line bundle, and then you can kind of apply the Fedosov construction not only to, the, to the, the star product, but also to the line bundle, you get these bimodules, and this will be a Morita equivalence bimodule for the two star products, which, are, uh, which is now um, equivariant. And on the other hand, if, they are, if you have such a bimodule, you, you have to analyze its classical limit, and you get exactly this line bundle with a lift. Yeah? And, and, and so, so this is, in some sense, the idea of, of that um, proof. Okay, I think I should stop here. Yeah. Thank you.